Now, in the remaining time today, so we also have an example here in the slides. Uh, I will skip it because I will move on to something that is relevant to your assignment. And I assume this is something you would want me to do. And uh, I called it the third part of the big optimal mechanism topic. And this part is about optimal auctions. And the difference here is what would happen if you have <coughs> many buyers, but still one item. So how would our optimal mechanism change then? And the big moral of the story is, if you are already falling asleep, the moral of the story is nothing will change. So I will show you how to frame the problem in exactly the same way as we just had. And now we can fall asleep and read the slides later. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that. So, seller, designer, one item, no cost. Um, do I have two buyers, then buyers, and buyers? With valuations, say the I which will be IID, so again, independently distributed, but uh, identically with the same distribution with PDF5 and CDFF that we had before. With Euclidean utility functions, And so the designer chooses a mechanism which is now given by a vector of k's for every player, kn of theta, and transfers, again, vector for all players, tn of theta. And this is for all phases. So again, the same problem, just many buyers. How do we solve it? We solve it in three easy steps. Step one. We show monotonicity. Step two. We show EIP. EIP. And let's pause for a second before step three. So we want to choose a mechanism. We want the mechanism to be incentive compatible, as usual. But we have seen two different notions of incentive compatibility. We can try to find a dominant strategy incentive compatible mechanism, or we can find a Bayesian incentive compatible mechanism. In these problems, we usually just go with Bayesian. We do not bother to provide incentives that are that strong, uh, so strong as dominant strategies. So we just say, you know, Bayesian mechanism is good enough. And this means that which version of the envelope representation of pairs should we use? The one for Bayesian mechanisms. Because remember, we had two. One was for dominant strategies, was framed in terms of Allocations given, profile of types, theta minus i. For Bayesian mechanisms, it was for allocations and transfers, which were expectations over theta minus i. So we use that. And we proceed to step three. Step three is doing all the same manipulations that we did before. But what we have now is <clears throat> The expected revenue of the principal is now the sum of players' transfers. So not just one player's transfer.
but we can still try to disentangle the problem into into a set of different problems, one problem for every agent. That's what I meant to say. So let's split this into expectation over different players types. So let's first take the sum out, change the order of the sum and the expectation, and then we will have the expectation for every player over their player's own type, expectation over other players' types, theta minus i, of ti of theta. And so at this point, we can use the similar representation of pairs for Bayesian mechanisms. Because then we can substitute that for, again, what do we have by analogy? We have the expected allocation of player i, ki of theta, minus the integral from 0 to theta i of the expected allocations of player i, k i of s theta minus i ds, minus the expected utility of type 0. Utility player i type 0 theta minus i. Okay, heads are coming up. So this is exactly what a null representation of pairs looks like in Bayesian setting. It says that the expected utility of any type theta i can be expressed as the expected utility of the lowest type plus the integral of allocations of expected allocations. And so then we can use that expected utility to express expected transfers. Right? See what I'm doing here? You see what I'm doing here? More or less? Okay, so just to make sure. Let's let me write out the expected uh, ERP for the AC mechanisms. Expectation over theta minus i of u i of theta i theta minus i equals expected over theta minus i u i of zero theta minus i minus or plus the integral from zero to theta i of theta minus i ki theta of s theta minus i ds. So this is how the envelope representation of pairs looks like. And by definition, this expected utility equals, on the other hand, so the def by definition of expected utility, this will be equal to theta i times the expected uh, allocation of player i minus the expected transfer. Psi, ti, theta i, theta minus i. And from here you can see that I made a mistake when I wrote that expression for the expected revenue. Exactly. There is theta i missing that should be here. Good. All right, cool. So we use this envelope representation of pairs to get this expression. In principle, I guess you can use the envelope representation of pairs for domain strategies to get a different expression and work with that. You know, I, I won't judge you. But it's more common to see Bayesian mechanisms there. And so from this expression, what you can see is you can do all of the same perverted stuff that we did for a single player for every player i. So if we just focus on, we fix some player i and we focus on this bracket for player i, the problem is exactly as it was before. 
I guess we also need the expectation. So we can do all of that. And I believe the slides go through that in some amount of detail. But what you will arrive to in the end, this expected revenue will, give, will be given by the sum of expectations for every player over that player's type of ki bar. So, okay, let me. I'm writing all the expectations, so let me write the expectation. Theta minus i of k, theta i, theta minus i, <coughs> times the virtual surplus of player i given type theta i. OK, you might be a little confused, because in the Myers mechanism, we wrote this slightly differently. We, did, we wrote this expectation as integral of k times the virtual surplus phi theta i d theta i. But this is exactly the expectation over type theta i. And then the final step. You just swap these expectations and sums around one more time. And what you get is you get the expectation over theta of sum of overall players of k theta i theta minus i times vs i of theta i period. Again, what we do be, be, between these two lines is we swap the order of integration and summation. And we are allowed to do that. So what you can see is we arrive to the exact same expression that we had, except now we have sum over, over players. So before, without the sum, k was maximal whenever virtual surplus was positive. K was minimal whenever virtual surplus was negative. Or that was the idea, if, if virtual surplus was well behaved. What happens now is almost the same. Now you give the item, so you set K to 1, to the player with the highest virtual surplus. And that's it. And if all players have negative virtual surplus, you just don't give the item to anyone. And this would be your optimal mechanism. Once again, you must verify that k is monotone in that case for every player. I guess if you're looking for Bayesian mechanism, just the expected allocation for every player must be monotone. Right? So you always need the right kind of mechanism. If you have two people who have the same highest payoff, then what? If there are two people that have this same virtual surplus and it's the highest, then it's a tie, you break ties any way you want. You can give it to one, you can give it to another, you can flip a coin between the two. Yeah, the usual tie-breaking talk. Yeah. So the question was, doesn't it feel like cheating? Uh, since we are trying to extract uh, players' private information status, but we are already assuming some distribution of, the, of this private information. And, well, yes and no. In some settings, when you run some auction repeatedly, you can gauge the distribution of players' valuations from past auctions you ran, you organized. Right? You assume that players are more or less the same every time, and um, yeah, something like that. No, but then you, you know what the distributions are. So you know what kind of players you can get. You say that you get uh, about 30% of just uh, people who walk around aimlessly and don't value the item at all. You usually have one or two people who value the item a lot, but you do not know who is whom. Right? That's the idea. So even if you know the distribution, you do not know which of the players is which. That is more or less the way to view it. 
And uh, it might, another interpretation of this is that the designer has access to some information about the valuation of the item for every player, but every player just has more information. So they have a sharper signal about their valuation. So in this case, uh, theta i would be effectively random from the designer's standpoint, because the designer does not observe this additional information. Right. Good. So the question is, uh, what is this magic with the expectations, and why did we drop the subscript? Uh, here we did not drop the subscript, we just combined these two expectations into one. Right? So this is a one integral over theta i. This is n minus one integrals over all other thetas. So together, these are n integrals over all types. And so here, I am not careful enough about when I say theta is one player's type and one when theta is type profile. But here, what I mean is type profile theta. Just a few concluding remarks. So what we have done is we have seen monopolistic screen. We have seen what the insights are from there. We have done Myerson's optimal mechanism. We have seen that all of the insights continue to hold in that more general model that we solve differently. And finally, we have now seen what happens with many players. And we saw that once again, all pretty much all the same stuff works. All the same stuff still holds. One other kind of vague advertisement in addition to that paper about uh, one by many items. There is literature on optimal contests. That we will not be talking about. But to just give you a couple of words about what it is. It is more or less similar to this optimal auction thing that we did. The difference is there are some settings where you do not have as much freedom in designing your mechanism or your auction. Uh, for example, I'll use the prominent example with contests is some sports competitions where the winner must take the biggest prize, the second runner must take the second prize and so on. But you still have some freedom in designing the payoffs. So you can select how many prizes you have, how big is the drop-off, how significant is the drop-off from the first place to the second to the third, and so on. So you still have some freedom. And so there you are designing this literature. People are designing the optimal reward schemes in order to induce this maximal effort in contests. So you can see, you can see this as an all-pay auction. Right? Everybody exerts some effort. They might get some outcome, which is maybe random conditional on effort, but then they get some price conditional on their outcome. And so there is a literature on this, but it feels kind of too, too specific for us. We, we are talking general, general mechanisms. But this is something that you can do. This is one remark. Second remark that I forgot to make about optimal auctions. If the buyers are symmetric, as we just assumed, then we can actually implement this mechanism in a very simple way, right? Uh, we, yeah, many times we just look at these direct revelation mechanisms where players are reporting their types and we just give them some allocation and transfers. In reality, there are simpler mechanisms that usually do the job. So in this case, if buyers are symmetric, any auction will do the, will do the job. Second price, for example as long as you set a reserve price. So a second price auction with a reserve price would be our optimal auction with symmetric buyers. Because there you do achieve the exact same thing. If the virtual surplus is, if, sorry, if buyers are symmetric, then these functions VSI are the same for all players. So you, and if they are monotone, if your distribution of values is good enough, then you still want to select the player with the highest theta. Second price auction does that. And then the reserve price allows you to commit to not sell to the lowest value buyers. How do you set the reserve price? Optimally, yes. 
Well, this is your object of choice. This is something you maximize over. And it will depend on the distributions of valuations. 